careful what we're saying, especially Peter. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to chair this, this first session today uh, on the last day of this fantastic workshop. Um, and our first speaker is Peter Barker from University College London, and he will be speaking about charged levitated nano oscillators for testing macroscopic quantum mechanics. Peter, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I, this is generally what I'll be talking about, but I've added a few extra little things to uh, sort of relate it a little bit more to the, the topic of the conference. So um, let me just, I guess I'm not sharing my screen yet, so I better do that. Okay, so can you see that? Can you see my screen? Yes, yeah. Good, because I can't. Okay, all right. So um, as I said, uh, what I will talk about is primarily um, charge levitated nano oscillators, but I really kind of want to relate the experiments that we've been doing as a really a levitated optic mechanics group to, to this type of experiment. So um, let me make a start. Okay, so, um, so we've seen this diagram many, many times. I'm really not going to talk about it too much. Really what I want to talk about, uh, what I see as you know, the experimental challenges um, to creating, well, even one um, macroscopic superposition uh, and um, really focus on that. Because I think once you've got one, it, it uh, may be um, a little bit easier the whole experiment to have two, but I'm not so sure about that. So I think, but you know, the really, what, what we really need to aim for is to get at least one superposition. Um, and so, you know, so we, over the years, we've been working uh, in levitated optomechanics in a range of different topics um, from cavity cooling of particles, uh, charged particles in a pool trap to feedback cooling of, of particles in, in optical traps, nanoparticles in optical traps, but also, uh, uh, you know, charged particle traps such as a, a pool trap. With, with really, I mean, the eventual aim for all of this is, is really to test quantum mechanics. Um, and, and really that's kind of what I'll talk about. And I'll really talk about it in context, at least initially in terms of this tech project uh, of which uh, Hendrik and essentially many of the authors that I showed you on the front page there are involved in. Because a lot of the issues for this um, program <laughs> are really the same issues for, for example, if you want to do um, uh, you know, uh, this entanglement experiment. So, so I'll talk a little bit about you know, laser refrigeration, what we've done and what we're doing um, and, and other things as well. Um, so, so let's make a start. So obviously the, you know, the, the real issue here is how does one create a long lived macroscopic superposition? And, um, you know, obviously many people are looking into this and many experimentalists at this meeting are talking about that. And of course, you know, one of the first ones is to be able to control um, the particle motion. Um, and that's obviously levitation. So one of the things is actually having particles um, that are of suitable properties and the ability to cool them so that you can actually put them into a trap and then perhaps drop them out of the trap. Um, there's no such thing as a spherical particle. Uh, you know, they all have some um, shape to them. And so there's also this issue of, of getting orientational control. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And of course, you know, the, the really important thing is really how do we de uh, control any decoherence? For example, in our case, you know, that's charge, uh, but it's also fluctuations in fields, but it's also actually scattering of, of, of things such as light when you're using it for both detection and also manipulation. And of course, there's, there's the issue of gravitation as well, which I won't really discuss. Um, I'll talk about uh, basically requiring a low internal temperature and how we might um, come about that. Mm. And also, also touch on the fact that we, it, I mean, my, having done these sorts of experiments for a long time, what is super important is really having a, 
a set of well characterized near identical particles. And if, if you have loaded a particle, you'd actually like to use it over and over again because you spend quite a bit of time characterizing them. So, so if you do need to load these things again, you need near identical well characterized particles. So this, this is a, a current pull trap that we use um, to trap um, Nano silicon nanospheres on the order of uh, radius of 200 nanometers. Um, we can trap smaller and larger, and of course that depends on the type of experiment that you want to do. What you see uh, here is a is a, a guide, um, um, electrostatic guide, so we can um, load particles in through an electrospray apparatus, which essentially means we have a solution of these particles. Um, we apply a very high voltage to um, a tube here and the particles are expelled and by Coulomb repulsion, essentially you get smaller and smaller particles uh, and, and you get a charge that's distributed over these that can be then deposited in the trap. And, and this we have quite good control over the charge. We can have, you know, future, well, I would say not good control, but we have many charges. Um, and so we can, you know, we can have, we've, we've trapped up to 8,000, 10,000 uh, elementary charges on a particle down to a few. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So, so the reason behind this trap and actually the, the, the next trap that we will use, which I won't talk about today, but the reason why we have investigated this is um, or develop this is really to um, look at um, wave function collapse basically of, of macroscopic systems. And of course, you know, the ideal way of doing this, of course, would be to create a superposition and do interference. Um, but the tech project is really um, looking at this um, through a, a simpler experiment. And that is this non-interferometric route, which a number of people um, have discussed prior to this program. And the idea here is that, for example, if, you, if you're trying to create a superposition, then there's some uh, sort of um, process um, and, and what we're looking at is a process called con continuous spontaneous localization, or at least trying to test for that, uh, that continually tries to localize the wave function. And so what this comes across as, 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 a, as a type of Brownian motion. So this would appear as a, or it's, uh, as, as a type of Brownian motion um, that would exist. Um, and the, the issue here is that this type of Brownian motion or other Brownian motions such as collisions with gas molecules and a range of other things such as scattering of light also create this. And so the challenge really is can we, you know, could we isolate, uh, could we see this type of induced Brownian motion? Um, and so what this really is, is, is really, uh, uh, this is something developed by a range of people um, and, and actually uh, Angela Bassi, who's a leader in this field, is, is um, leading this tech program. And the idea is that there's a modification um, to the sort of standard quantum mechanics to um, Schrodinger equation, which basically relates to um, the mass, essentially. So there's a, there's a collapse rate and there's a correlation radius that relates to essentially to the mass of nucleons in the, in the system that you're studying. And, and the essential idea is that as that mass increases, then this collapse rate increases such that if, you know, if you're looking at an atomic system, then you would expect, for example, this collapse rate is very small. And as you increase the mass that it would increase. And, and whilst there's, uh, you know, uh, there's a, a, a model and the, the, the beauty of the continuous spontaneous localization model is that you can, it's calculatable. So even though we might not know what um, this collapse rate um, gamma is or this correlation length RC is, um, you could, for, for a particular value, you can calculate what that collapse rate would be. And so uh, there are, you know, this has been constrained already by a number of experiments, um, particularly uh, experiments like Marcus Arndt, who can actually constrain it quite well in some sense, at least in a, in a firm way by, by doing interference experiments, but also by um, looking at oscillators. So looking at noise in oscillator systems. And so for example, um, you know, a test mass such as the, you know, the Lisa Pathfinder has been used by Angela Bassi to, to really put limits on this. So the idea is to take uh, this 
a step further into this, so there's a region here, an exclusion plot here, uh, is to take, uh, use this tech program that is trapped nanoparticles to microparticles and look at the noise and place limits um, on continuous spontaneous localization. And, and so our, our role in this is, is to um, develop the Paul trap with others um, as a, as a low noise mechanic loss later to make these tests. And so it's in principle, a simplistic idea is that you take a particle shown here as this gray um, ball in some um, potential. In this case, we're interested in a, in a pole, pole trap potential oscillating at some frequency. And the idea is you just measure the noise in this system. Um, and, and so, you know, you would expect there's going to be contributions due to black body radiation, gas collisions. If you're using light, there's going to be recoil of photons and also potentially um, this noise from this collapse process. Uh, and that's what we would like to do. And so, you know, one way of, of doing this is to characterize other, the other no noise sources so well that you can differentiate between them. And that's, and that's kind of a bit of an issue because, you know, how do you differentiate between that type of collapse noise and other noise? Mm. And, and so here is, here is a, um, a plot that uh, looks at that. So for example, you could cool the particle down um, and allow it to heat and after some time make a measurement of its, of its temperature effectively or the number of uh, phonons in the system. And so if we were to look at that with respect to pressure, um, you could see that, you know, with, with CL cell at low pressures where gas doesn't dominate, then you should have a, 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 an increased noise level. Of course, the difficult thing about that is that, you know, how do you differentiate between other noise sources? And this is where the fact that um, the size of the particle, so this correlation radius or um, is important such that, for example, if I could put in different size spheres and do the same uh, test of heating, can we see some variation um, due to increased collapse, for example, at, the, at this correlation length? In this case, it's uh, about 200 nanometers. So, so there is some potential here really to differentiate between um, other noise sources, but at least if we know what the noise sources are to put limits on these models. And so that's the aim really of tech. So, you know, as I've, as I've said, what this comes down to is knowing your system well and um, characterizing the noise as best as you can. And, and for us, because we're using charged particles, then that's voltage noise or, or noise due to things such as patch potentials. And, uh, but of course, another noise source is, of course, if I'm using, for example, um, light to measure uh, the particles, I have to illuminate it, it's going to absorb a small amount of light, even though if I'm putting something like, you know, 10 femtowatts of power, there's some absorption. So the, the beauty of levitation is that it's isolated. The disadvantage, of course, is isolated. And so, you know, if you get some heating, <laughs> then there's no way to get it out unless via black body radiation, which, of course, is not very efficient unless you're at high temperatures. So, so essentially, what we're aiming for is a forced noise measurement um, at, uh, at about 10 to the minus 44 Newton squared per hertz. And, and this, um, by our reckoning, is, is going to be limited by the electronic noise that we have um, in our pole trap, because essentially we can control most other noise sources. So this is what um, I said, this is what our pole trap looks like. And this is just a kind of some pictures of characterization. So it has three well-defined frequencies, low frequencies. But of course, the nice thing about a pole trap is that, you know, we have some control. We have some control over the charge and we can have some control over the, the, um, the voltages that we apply um, to the pole trap. And so we have some control of, over the, the frequency, which is sometimes useful if, you know, you have noise peaks and you need to move these things around. And so what, what is shown down here, of course, is we can change. We have control of the charge. We can add charge. Mm. We can subtract charge um, by single um, units of, of charge. And so that's very useful as well. And of course, we can apply feedback cooling to this system. And so this is just a plot of the, the temperature as a function of um, feedback gain, which we use to cool and show that it actually it agrees fairly well with um, theoretical um, considerations. And so, you know, in our case, we don't need to really cool below tens of millikelvin, um, uh, but 
in principle, you can cool much lower than this. Um, so just to just to sort of show you that we're on track for these um, experiments is so this is uh, basically um, a prediction of the so so the essence is is that if we have excess noise for example from charge then this leads to an excess temperature and, and heating and and so what you see here is essentially uh, a plot of pressure and temperature um, based on where the particle sits within the center of the trap um, and. And really, most of the noise is eventually dominated by the, the DC noise um, from either the end caps or, or DC voltages that we need to apply to compensate for uh, offsets in the electric field. And so what, what this diagram also shows you that, of course, you know, it makes sense that if you this noise goes as Q squared, such that if you can work with fewer charges, then you're going to have a lower noise system. And we predict that we can get where we want to be at about 10 to the minus 13 millibar for these experiments. And just, just to show you that from these electronics now, and I should say these electronics actually have been developed by INFN at Frascati um, and um, Gadrusen. Aarhus University, that's sort of the DC and AC components of this that have been important for actually getting the noise down in this um, system. So, um, so we're kind of on track there. And I just want to show you some of the things that we've done with this system. So when, of course, if the nice thing about the system is it's not, um, there is there is very little light. We use light to make a measurement of the, of the displacement of the particle, but it's very much lower than you would have in an optical trap, which is um, typically used. And so, um, you know, other than electronic noise, there's very little heating. Um, but even in the presence of electronic noise, actually, we can measure uh, the line width of these oscillators quite um, accurately. And so here's a measurement, um, you know, as we go down in pressure um, to show that basically we can measure the line width of these oscillators down to the microhertz regime. Uh, and, and one of the challenges of this experiment is that, of course, as you go down in pressure, because there is very little damping, if you want to make a measurement, for example, of line width, then you have to make measurements over many, many days to actually measure such narrow line widths. And that becomes a challenge. And it also becomes a challenge for the tech experiment as well, because you know, we expect this very low, no, low noise levels. So it means that we have to make measurements over very long periods of time and understand um, what our noise is like. So actually what we, what we have done, so we, you can essentially measure this line with um, a, a, as a function of temperature, and you can find out based on your data where it would cross um, the axis. And uh, there is a modification to the standard collapse model that takes into account um, dissipation. So this is dissipative um, uh, continuous spontaneous localization. And um, using, so, so now uh, this, the, the collapse, relates to essentially it has a, a line width and a temperature and so if you can measure the line width you can uh, put limits uh, based on a particular temperature as we've done here so this is i mean this is really something that we've done because we can measure the line width and you know really now we have much lower noise as we're really moving on to the final um, tech experiment which by the way um, will be done in Southampton and Henrik's group um, in his 300 millikelvin cryostat. So um, it's a joining of forces here. So just before I sort of move away from Paul traps, and I know I don't have much time, is, is um, of course, you can trap two particles in this in, into this system, um, and, and that may be of interest. Um, and so what I have here is a plot of the Coulomb, Casimir, and gravitational forces, a function of separation. Uh, for example, in the trap. And you can see in our case, these are 200 nanometer uh, particles. So if we had 50 charges, you can see that it's completely dominated by the Coulomb force. And I mean, maybe this is interesting in, in that you could do an entanglement type experiment with, uh, you know, using Coulomb forces as a sort of prelude to, um, to, to gravitational um, experiments. But it's interesting that, you know, if you start to change the charge, which we can control and change the mass, then of course, you know, the, the strength of these um, uh, forces changes. So you can see that the Casimir is very strong, but actually at, at, at further out, then the, um, you know, the gravitational force is, is slightly dominant over the Coulomb force. So it's an interesting thing to think about. So, 
So as I said, heating is probably one of the major problems in this system. So even though you can levitate a particle, uh, you know, in a cryostat, you know, there's no, if you're using light in particular, there's no reason to believe that it's going to stay at any near that temperature. And so um, one of the things that we've worked on is to mitigate this heating. And so, you know, for example, heating can lead to spin de decoherence in NV diamond. Um, you know, I talked about black body radiation before, but it can even increase um, the effect of gas collisions because essentially um, there's an additional recoil when you have a hot object when a particle collides with a hot object. So it's something that needs to be, you know, controlled. And so one of the things that we have done in the past is to, to explore laser refrigeration. And, and this is an idea where you have an embedded um, uh, dopant, such as a terbium three plus ions. And uh, essentially what you could do is you can um, pump them on this band edge. And if the lifetime of these levels is long enough, then you get a thermalization and you can actually cool um, or at least in principle, cool these uh, objects down. And so we have done this with um, small particles of terbium uh, yttrium lithium um, fluoride. And, and so what you have here is essentially you have, uh, so I, I mentioned that you get kind of atomic-like spectra from these um, dopants, but you only really get that um, spectra at very low temperatures. Um, and so what we have done is, is, is look at the spectra of these things. And we've also measured their um, uh, translational motion in the trap. And, um, and using this process, we've shown at least for some particles that we can get down to 130 Kelvin. So this is you know, better than 300 Kelvin, but ideally you would like to get much lower. And that's, that's a, a work in progress, but a potential way of controlling the temperature um, when levitating particles. So, so these actually are these uh, atobium um, yield particles. And, and what's also important is that we can characterize their shape. And, um, and perhaps Tong King Lee will speak more about this, but this is actually these particles trapped in an optical trap. And what we have done is to, um, we can see very small differences in their size um, due to their um, alignment within the optical field. So the frequency of their alignment within the optical field is very sensitive to their size. And so what you see here in the simulation is simu uh, uh, the changes in this uh, orientational, um, so this is the spectrum of, of this pendulum of motion um, in the field. And you can see very small changes of 5% make a significant measurable difference. And so this is a way of characterizing these particles that we're using for refrigeration, but we also may use them um, in the tech experiment as well, because we can orient them with uh, like uh, optical fields. Five so, minutes, okay, Peter. Five minutes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm on my last topic here. So another thing that um, we've been exploring is, you know, are there other alternatives to NV diamond? And, and Ron Fullman really talked about a little bit about this yesterday. And, and you know, we have experience of, of trapping diamonds and burning diamonds. Um, and, and not only that, I mean, because it's a dopant that's embedded in the solid state matrix, it's not very atomic-like spectra. And so we've spent a little bit of time really looking at, can we, for example, take um, the, uh, the, the very beautiful <laughs> atomic, um, atomic systems and couple them to um, the nanosphere. And so what, what we have here is there are a number of ways of doing this. And this is work that's been done with um, Sagato and um, uh, Marco Turos um, is, is basically to use light fields. And here's one example where you can illuminate this um, system and create a, a, a fairly long range light field that can be used to not only repel, um, for example, cold atoms, but uh, so you could use it, for example, for sympathetic cooling, but perhaps of more interest is that by combining optical potentials, you can create essentially a, an atom nanosphere uh, where, whereby you have uh, both a repulsive and an attractive potential, including Casimir interactions to create essentially a trapped system. And this system may be of interest um, instead of, for example, like an NV. Um, this is a little bit different because, you know, it's not, it's, it's tightly bound by say 100 to 1000 kilohertz, but not as tightly bound as you would have in a solid state system, but nevertheless an interesting possibility. 
um, to explore and it's something that we expect to explore. So, and, you know, the question is what would be, you know, decoherence, for example, of, of well-defined spin states in this system, but it does, does open up the possibility of using well-known atomic species, you know, rubidium, cesium, or, or any, any species that you want um, to create these potentials. And so for us, it's an exciting possibility to, to explore. But of course, you know, what, what will that lifetime be? And that really needs experiments because, you know, there's fluctuations in the optical field. There's also vibrations of the nanosphere, which will reduce that time. And that needs to be considered. So finishing off there. So my conclusion is a lot of work has been done already. But there's even more work to be to be done um, if we want to do these experiments, um, and so I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks, Peter. Great, a great talk. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, it's open for questions now. Um, there's already one from Andy. Andy Gracie, please, Andy, fire away. Yeah, really nice talk, Peter. Uh, so just a question on this really last idea that you mentioned that sounds really interesting with coupling atoms to nanosphere. So what are you envisioning for the coupling mechanism in that case with the sympathetic uh, uh, interaction? I'm glad, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, so uh, so essentially, you know, for, for sympathetic cooling, for example, I can just have uh, a field that's um, blue detuned from a resonance. So it's a completely repulsive. It's a very long range. So it's a very long range Coulomb-like potential. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, because, because it's long range, it has a cross section six orders of magnitude larger than its actual physical cross section. So it seems, you know, it seems quite an attractive way of doing it. And that's a single field, all that's required. I mean, a single field that's propagating in six, six directions, but uh, a single field. And so, you know, and, and basically the, the particle carries the field with it wherever it is in the, in the trap, because, you know, basically the, the field is made by the particle. So it's an experiment that we really would like to try. Interesting. And then really briefly, how do you fabricate those diamond shape uh, y ytterbium crystals? <laughs> well, um, we don't do them. So this is this is um, by a group in Delft by Ariane Hutapan. And um, they're spending a lot of time. Um, so that, I mean, they have great expertise in, in making these crystals. And the beauty of it is they can make them with a fairly small spread. And so it's really useful for doing these tests. Um, but they're also working on, you know, it, it basically improving the quantum efficiency in these things for cooling as well. So, you know, that's, I'm glad you brought it up because they're a very important part of this project. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, good. Kevin is next. Kevin, please ask your question. Hi, Peter. Great, uh, great stuff. Um, can you tell me, um, you know, what's the heaviest thing that you can levitate with one charge in a pull trap? And um, does, that, does that question make sense? Uh, no, <laughs> is the answer. I mean, we, we haven't really tried and I haven't done the calculations, but, um, you know, I my, my guess is that we can. I mean, there will be challenges with that. I think it would need to be, you know, a few charges um, because, you know, gravity becomes so significant. So it wouldn't be just a sort of standard pull trap. You'd actually have to have something to support it against gravity. But, you know, you can have like a, you know, a vertical um, chamber. I mean, it's, it was really basically just to show that, you know, actually Tom the other day trapped one and we thought, well, you know, this is interesting. Can we see any other forces? And, um, you know, if they're large, I mean, it really, you can really tune it and because you can actually change the end, the end caps you can push them together as well so it may be a way of since it you know we can know the charges very well it might be a way of sort of calibrating you know measurements with gravity i don't know it's just a it's just an idea yeah yeah no i thought that was exciting the theory plot where you showed that you know gravity could um be bigger than the casimir and the um yeah not too long that was great yeah Hey, good. So, so next is Marcus. Hi, Marcus. Uh, please ask your question. Yeah, thanks. Um, nice talk and good to see all the progress. Um, question to the tech project. Um, so I, I like the idea. I'm just uh, wondering, so I'm trying to understand a bit better how the, how the scheme would, would work then in, in practice. So if all these different particles that you can load also through spray, which, which is great, then they have different charges. 
Um, but then you have to know which kind of thing you have. And, and there are how, so question number one is probably how accurate is the reproducibility of the particles that you can load? It's, I guess it's about a few percent. Is that good enough? Question number one. And question number two, that you can scale the mass, that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the charge to mass ratio within a given trap is kind of limited. And so if you vary the mass, you also have to vary the charge. And is, is that then really comparing the same things? Um, or how, how much leeway do you have in, in varying the trap parameters to have still the same number of charges for varying masses? You know what right. I mean? Well, I mean yeah. Perturbing later. Yeah, I mean, you know, I guess, I mean, we're primarily interested in mass or, you know, radius for these particular um, things. So to me, the, the charge is only important in terms of the noise that it causes, which is important, obviously. But, but you know, we have, I think we have, I mean, that's the beauty of the pull trap. I think, you know, you have a good way of characterizing um, charge and charge to mass. Um, but what real, I mean, what is, I think, you know, you're challenging is that, you know, it's really always difficult to, to characterize these particles, you know, because there is significant variance as shown yesterday, you know, in the density. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, I guess in the end, you know, <laughs> the sort of thing you need to do is, is extract it. And maybe, but, you know, we can certainly quite easily tell whether we have one particle or two mm -hmm. particles, mm -hmm. you know, from, from basically the damping, you know, we have the damping as well as the, um, you know, as well as the charge to mass ratio and its behavior in the trap. So it's, we have a fair, you know, compared to many, you know, for example, the optical trap, I think, you know, you have extra handles there. But yeah, I mean, that's always a challenge. And, and what but, it's, sorry for interrupting, but you would essentially just work with a single particle, say, for a month or two or three. And uh, so once it's characterized, you can work with it for the rest of the year. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah that's right. That's the idea. Yeah. Okay. And, and the thing is, I mean, you know, we, we, they do stay there and for a really long time. I mean, you know, as long as you leave them. And also, you know, we haven't had issues where they you know, at least on the observation times that we have, where the charges change. I mean, we initially mm -hmm. had you know, having uh, vacuum gauges, which, which would change the charge. But, you know, once you get those away and turn them off, it's mm -hmm. sort of quite well. Okay. Okay, good. So um, in, um, let's maybe move the, the, there are more questions, but maybe let them move to the, to the panel discussion part later. So let's move on with, with the talks. Um, so thanks, Peter, again, please, can you unshare your yeah, slides and then yeah, the next go. speaker can uh, share their slides. And our next speaker is uh, Harry Das from the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in uh, Chennai in, in India. I hope I pronounced this correctly. Um, and the topic is uh, simple experiments to prove, prove, to probe, sorry, parity violation in gravitation uh, and their theoretical uh, implementation. So Harry, are you there? Yes, okay, we can see the slides. Um, please start your presentation. You're muted. You have to unmute. Still, still not unmuted. Can Thank can you. you write in yeah. the chat? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Now it works. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So firstly, let me thank the organizers for this most wonderful, inspiring meeting where I have found uh, every talk to be of uh, interest and inspiration, which is rather unusual. So my sincere thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. What I'm going to be talking about are uh, laboratory, in fact, even tabletop, experiments to probe um, parity violations in gravitation. This is a work I did long ago in 1975, and uh, maybe half the audience was not even born at the time. But uh, over the years, a uh, lot of interest has built up in this area. And to me, what is important is that a lot of experimentalists have taken interest in uh, checking out these ideas. First, a disclaimer. This work addresses actually 
certain um, um, novel gravitational interactions of quantum matter. It says almost nothing about quantum nature of the gravitational fields. This important distinction was highlighted by Carlo Rovelli in his very first talk. Now there is voluminous literature on parity violations in recent times, possibly manifested by the gravitational fields themselves, and also addressing their detection through gravitational wave radiation. This is a very, very exciting development, and it is bound to turn up a lot of uh, interesting and fundamental uh, issues. I suggest looking up a recent archive article by Obukov, and it has an extensive literature on parity violations of this type. But my disclaimer is that whatever is discovered, discussed there is mostly irrelevant for this talk. This is also witnessed by the fact that Obukov makes no mention of my works. Most of these so-called uh, Chen Simon's gravities and their extensions. And they call it the most general parity violating interactions. And I take issues with that. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now, what were the motivations? General relativity demands that orbital angular momentum, like a classical gyroscope, and uh, intrinsic spin, like spin of a neutron, must respond the same way to a gravitational field. Otherwise, the principle of equivalence and the consequent geometrical interpretation would break down. But do they really behave like this? Now, this is something that has to be settled experimentally. In the non-gravitational sectors of our understanding, there's a second motivation of elementary particles. What we notice is that as the interactions get weaker, say from strong interactions to electromagnetic interactions to weak interactions, more and more symmetries are violated, particularly of the discrete type. So from that point of view, it would be reasonable to expect gravitation, which in some sense is the weakest interaction at the level of elementary particles to violate various discrete symmetries like uh, charge conjugation, parity, and time reverse. GR does not violate any of these. Now, there are, I give you some key references. One is a PRL where I propose very simple experiments to probe these issues. Then I wrote a very, very detailed article on not only giving um, an account of the existing limits, theoretical implications, and proposals for future experiments. And uh, unfortunately, uh, experimenters don't seem to be aware of this second paper, as I see that only my first paper is uh, cited, but it's very important to look up the second paper to put the effects that I proposed in the first paper in the proper perspective. I also wrote a article for general, uh, Journal of General Relativity and Gravitation, which sort of uh, gives a flavor of this. Then in 1999, almost 25 years after my first paper, I just revised, I just took a look at what all experiments have been done and found that uh, some very exciting experiments had been done in, with atoms, like uh, mercury cell, atom traps, etc. And uh, so in this paper, I've analyzed the implications of all these experiments and what kind of new limits that they set. Now, my idea was to look for possible tests in the simplest physical systems. So I chose non-relativistic particles, but elementary particles with intrinsic spin, like slow neutrons interacting with very weak field gravitation. You could take Earth's gravitation. The leading order spin dependent potential, you can just write it down based on rotational invariance, but without assuming parity, time reversal, and other such invariances. And this is the 
general potential that you can write down. It has got three parameters. And uh, general relativity predicts that alpha one and alpha two must vanish. And alpha three has to be three halves if Thomas precision is taken into account is equal to two if Thomas precision is not taken into account. In 64, Leitner and Okubo had given a parameterization of similar effects. It sort of looks similar to mine, but has a totally different interpretation. And in fact, the AIs in their parameterizations you know, are misleading because if you translate it into my parameterization, they're actually all dependent. And this has led to a lot of confusion in the literature uh, when, they, when people are putting limits on it and when they find that A1 is 10 to the minus eight, they think, wow, that's a great limit. But uh, in fact, as I will show, in terms of alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, many of them are hopeless limits because it implies that alpha one is of the order of 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 15, etc. My aim is to root for experiments that will put limits on alpha one, alpha two, alpha three of order one. And that's a great uh, challenge. And um, what really motivated me to look at such things with some seriousness was that already in 1975, Ramsey's electric dipole moment type of uh, setup could probe alpha one, you know, of the order of say 100 or so. So then I thought with improved technology, in fact, the EDM technology has improved by orders of magnitude that a day will come and we can probe whether alpha one is of order one or not. So that's the main thrust of my talk. So I'll only concentrate on alpha one. As for non-relativistic systems, they are the largest of the three. For relativistic particles, all of them are comparable. So what are some of the observable effects? One is differential acceleration. So if you take the Earth's acceleration axis, then uh, neutrons will spin up and neutrons will spin down. We have different acceleration. And this differential acceleration has a formula like that. And if alpha one is of order one, this is 10 to the minus 22 for neutrons, 10 to the minus 19 for electrons and 10 to the minus 23 to 24 for atoms. Electrons are very hard to deal with because they are charged particles. Whereas the neutrons, you know, there is some hope. And in fact, that is what Ramsey really demonstrated with his EDM experiment. Now the E-TWAS type experiments put no limits because they're not performed with polarized masses. If you could do E-TWAS with chiral masses, then you can start putting some limits. And very, very recently, torsion balances with chiral masses have been done. And here is a reference. And they give the limit eta, which is 10 to the minus 13. And uh, this is uh, not at all very, very, very useful. OK. So what do we do next? Hyperfine structure in hydrogen is also sensitive to this. And if you, in 75, when I looked at this, if you could attribute the entire experimental uncertainty of about one millihertz to non-electromagnetic contributions and say this all comes from these parity violating interactions, then you could put a limit of alpha one less than 200. It looks very good, but this is very ad hoc and one needs a better treatment. And uh, about 10 years ago, I'll say 20 years ago, you know, there have been uh, experiments done with uh, atoms in traps, and uh, they have basically used this idea to put some limits, and I'll come to that later on. Now, differential bending of light. So around the sun, the famous bending experiment, which gave support to general relativity, if these ex ex effects are there, would say that uh, the bending will be different according to the state of polarization, and uh, you could put some limits on that. Harvitt in 1974 obtained the limit that alpha one is 10 to the 10, which is not at all useful, but still it was a limit of the first kind. And uh, Denison in his Cornell thesis 
did an improved limit on this and got alpha one to be less than 10 to the four, which was several orders of magnitude improvement over the previous type of limits. Now, astrophysical constraints. Now in this archive paper that I mentioned earlier, I have also analyzed various astrophysical constraints. I will not go into the details because of lack of time, but I'll simply cite the results and you can look up them. Now, there will be a differential propagation of neutrinos and photons, and therefore from some astrophysical objects, you can put a limit and Alameda, et cetera, they put a limit in the lightner okubo parameterization and it looked very nice, but in terms of alpha one, they give rather poor uh, limit of 10 to the 30, which is no good. Once again, the polarized photons will propagate differently. Therefore, if you look at a pulsar, it will have an impact on the pulse profile. And uh, this also can put a limit. And once again, even though it's better than the differential propagation of neutrinos and photons, it is still not all that great. Me with a graduate student and a colleague in Chennai, we looked at helicity flip scattering of massive neutrinos, which lead to cooling of neutron stars. And those days, the tau neutrino mass was not very well known. And if you assumed it to be one keV, then you could get a limit of alpha one around 300. But now this limit is about one eV, which means that the limit on alpha one is thousand times worse and still not so great. There are various other effects like cosmological rotation of photon polarizations. So all these things can be used in principle to set limits. Now I come to atom techniques. This is what I discovered when I read literature in uh, around 1999. The most accurate experiment of this type was performed by Venema, Majumda, Lamaro, Heckel, and Fortson. I've given the reference there. And uh, this was what is called a mercury cell co-magnetometer. And I'll tell you what the idea is. So if you look at the alpha one term, it leads to an additional spin precision, which is of the type. And this is independent of the mass of the spinning particle. And if you take Earth as a gravitating body, it leads to a precision frequency of 4.5 alpha one nanohertz. It's extremely tiny precision, but uh, nothing is beyond you know, technology and people in this conference have shown how you can push the technology to you know, greater and greater frontiers. And so one day, even this tiny precision frequency may become realizable. What's the catch? Now, such a tiny precision can also be simulated by a random magnetic field of about alpha one into 10 to the minus 11 Gauss. So you have to control magnetic fields to such an accuracy, which is really a Himalayan task to say the least. But in a core magnetometer, you trap two isotopes with different gyromagnetic to spin ratios now the random magnetic fields will affect both of them the same way. And by monitoring the precision frequencies of the two isotopes, you can actually cancel out or mod out the random field effect. The detail can be found in this beautiful paper by Venema. And I won't give the details because of lack of time. So important point of a co-magnetometer is that stray magnetic fields can be eliminated through appropriate combinations of observables. Now the ambient magnetic fields were reduced nevertheless to about 20 microgauss because you want to get rid of as much of ambient fields as possible. And a uniform field 10 milligauss was also applied. And the experiment consisted of flipping this uniform field and looking for correlated signals. This experiment is so accurate. The precision is so high that even the Earth's rotation frequency has to be taken into account. And that is 11.6 microhertz. And you can take that into account you know, by standard techniques. 
And finally, they gave a result for a parameter which is related to alpha one. So there are large systematic errors still, and uh, even the you know random errors are large, and these will have to be reduced in future. But the most encouraging feature is this translates to a limit of alpha one about 50 to 60, which is just one to one and a half magnitudes away from the region where we are interested in, which is alpha one of the order of one. So this experiment stands the best chance of settling the existence or otherwise of my proposed interactions. And in view of the very deep theoretical implications, which I'll come to you know, towards the end of my talk, it's highly imperative that this experiment be performed reducing all systematic and random errors. The next kind of experiments are ion and atom trap. And these were done by Vineland, where uh, they trapped beryllium plus ions in a penning trap. And since time is running out, I will, this is a hyperfine uh, measurement, and they were able to put a pressure limit of alpha one around 300. With Takahashi at Kyoto, I myself made a proposal to use two different isotopes in a magneto-optic trap. And uh, we at that time felt that alpha one of the order of one is feasible. In my 77 paper itself, I had identified spin echo techniques as a promising direction. This was based on some very wonderful ideas of Medzai. And recently, that is last year, Parnell has used a spin echo neutron interferometer, which is very similar to the Humpty Dumpty type Stengerlock interferometer, much discussed here, but the limits are not that encouraging yet. I have discussed the theoretical implications of this of the existence of this effect in great length in my annals of physics paper. If alpha one is non-vanishing, parity is violated in gravitational interactions. That in itself is a great uh, experimental result. It also means a breakdown of GR at quantum level because GR says alpha one has to be zero. It means intrinsic spins and classical gyroscopes precise differently in a gravitational field. It means in freely falling frames are not inertial, the parity violating precision would still be felt and you can tell it, you can tell the effects of gravitation in that. It's a breakdown of both the equivalence principle as well as local Lorentz invariance. Now here are some technical details. I'm running out of time, but I'll just, you know, give you the rough idea. Now you can write a relativistic one particle matrix elements, which are equivalent to the effects that I wrote. I'll only focus on the alpha one effect. On its own, it looks good because it's symmetric, second rank and conserved. But the point is that if you take arbitrary scattering processes and consider a Bremsstrahlung of a graviton and apply the conservation or the gauge invariance, then you get to the conclusion that alpha one type terms have to vanish. Now this is you know, rather surprising and you'll have to go through some technicalities, but I have verified it and Deser and Buller are very established field theorists. Now this means that if alpha one doesn't vanish, then the metric cannot be symmetric because that is the assumption that they had made. And in fact, no theory with a symmetric gravitational field will be valid, not just GR, okay? And again, there are some more uh, uh, technicalities. Now, uh, this means that if alpha one is experimentally found to be non-vanishing, we have to not only give up GR, we have to give up spin two theories, we have to give up the standard einstein cartan theories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Even the so-called Chen Simon gravities, which are invoked as the most general parity violating gravitational theories in the context of gravitational wave uh, detection, uh, cannot be used because they're all based on symmetric uh, gravitational fields. So the sweeping claims that these are the most general ones 
is certainly not correct. Now, what are the alternatives? In 77, I suggested using Einstein's non-symmetric theory, which he was grappling towards towards the very end of his life. And SN Bose actually collaborated with him on this and came up with a number of very inter interesting improvements. But uh, as soon as he heard of Einstein's death, I heard that he threw away the manuscript and abruptly stopped his research. Yeah, very emotional reaction. But um, you know we are the poorer for that. Now the other work was by Kenji Hayashi. He used the so-called Poincaré gauge theories of gravitation. In those theories, if you use minimal coupling, you again end up with symmetric gravitational fields, even though the connection could be asymmetric. In other words, have torsion. But more remarkably, he found that if he uses non-minimal couplings of such a gauge theory they necessarily break local Lorentz invariance and lead to theories in which the gravitational field is asymmetric. This theory may have other deeper problems and that still has to be studied very, very carefully. In fact, Deser and Damur have claimed that uh, there are the various problems with ghosts, et cetera, that uh, still is an open issue even though to the extent that I have looked at it, there doesn't seem to be a problem with ghosts, but uh, ghosts in field theory are uh, very, very problematic things, uh, much more problematic than ghosts in religions, you know, or in other contexts. So with these remarks, I end my talk and thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, that, that was a great talk. Thanks a lot for your contribution um, to the conference. So we have now some time for questions. Um, and I think Anupam will, will write maybe the questions into the chat. Um, so if you have questions, uh, then um, please ask them. Maybe I can start with my question first. So you, you mentioned a, a lot of different experiments. Uh, to test basically for for these alphas. So, what is the strongest bound which comes from from an experiment on alpha at the moment? Uh, you know, I have a little bit of a hearing problem. So, can you share your question in the chat? Then yeah, Anupam is, is doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Henry, could you please? Uh, I didn't do my, my while I was typing. So, please, could you uh, type it? Maybe. Uh, I type it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, I requested Anupam that, uh, uh, otherwise, uh, uh, how do we do this, Anupam? I didn't completely hear his question. Uh, yeah, so Henrik is typing, just... Uh, uh, yeah. He's typing. Sorry, this may be time consuming, but uh, maybe I can try, you know, Deciphering what what I hear. Okay, I have I have sent it okay, to you. Okay, now I got it. Chat. So, yeah. what is the strongest experimental bound on alpha? It is uh, Venema's um, you know mercury cell experiment, which gives uh, forty to fifty, and uh, I hope they will uh, go back to their experiment and uh, improve this. So, in terms of existing limits, that is the strongest experimental bound of as of uh, today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So Sugato, you have a question. Do you want to ask it or you want to also direct? I'm, I'm, I'm typing now, so I just, uh, I can see while I'm typing. Uh, well, yeah. just a comment. Okay. I think that SGI mm, has good potential for, um, you know, uh, one should check the SGI experience already done by Ron's group. Mm -hmm. uh, Big so, pardon? Then, yeah, I am just sending to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so just yes, what I, I, yes, I also agree with you on that. And in fact, the spin echo interferometer, which Parnell has uh, recently published some results, even though the results are very poor, is an SGI type uh, device. And I'll be very much interested in uh, communicating with our SGI mm -hmm. experts here to mm -hmm. see, you know, what can be done. And in fact, there are certain uh, angular dependencies in the effect. If you can use that, then uh, you can determine these parameters. 
far more accurately than just mm. assuming some generic parity violating potential because mm. this is a very specific model for parity violation. Thank you. Okay, good. So, so uh, Andy Gracie actually wrote uh, in the chat, uh, I think you just wrote to me, right, Andy? So I passed this on. Uh, Sorry, yeah, that would be great. I could, I could <laughs> type it to him I too. Sorry. <laughs> so the next question is in the chat for you. Uh, frame dragging experiments. I'm not really sure because that um, you know, first of all, you have to do it with uh, elementary particle. But uh, again, if you do a frame dragging experiment with neutrons, let's say, then uh, you will find that your classical gyroscope and the neutron spin should respond differently. It's a very interesting idea, but uh, I think it would be rather difficult. But nothing, you know, is difficult for our, you know, motivated experimentalists. And this is a very fundamental uh, theoretical issue, and so we should leave no stone unturned in uh, fixing the limits. Thank you. Okay. So if you wonder what actually the question was, the question was is if there's any limit on alpha from frame dragging experiment. So we just heard the answer to this. Uh, Anu Pam, do you have a question? Your, your hand is up or is yeah, that like in... <laughs> Typing it. Okay, so you have a question, good, yeah. So if you can if you can ask it so that everyone knows the question. Yeah, so my question is, uh, okay, first of all, very nice talk, a wonderful talk. So uh, my question to Harry is, have you yeah. checked the unitarity? Uh, could, 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 I, could I briefly answer your talk about uh, unitarity and ghost issues? Uh, when Hayashi proposed his uh, Poincaré invariant gauge theory, it seemed as if there were no ghost and unitarity issues. But you know, in field theory, to be completely confident of this is extremely difficult. And in particular, Desert and uh, Damur claim that there are some issues, but they can fix it. And I am looking at both of them because it's a very technical paper and generically, Addressing unitarity and ghost issues, even in normal field theories is difficult. And in gravitational field theories is that much harder, but uh, it is certainly something which uh, theoretical theory-minded people should uh, look at. And um, I'm going to write up a summary of this in addition to the slides that I've put here, and I will uh, briefly address those issues. It's a very important point. And I would keep an open mind on that. And I hope that there are no unitarity and ghost issues. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks again for, for, for the nice talk. And thank you. Uh, we move on with our next speaker. Um, so the next speaker is from uh, University of Oxford, uh, Simone Rijavec. I hope I pronounced the, the, the name correctly. And the topic of the talk is uh, decoherence effects in non-classicality tests of gravity. So Simone, please um, share your slides and fire away. Right. Can you see them? Yep. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, thanks a lot for uh, this opportunity today. Uh, it's been a very interesting conference, many interesting contributions. Uh, I will, um, in my talk, I will focus on one of the problems that we've seen in these days and that many, many contributors have touched uh, on, and uh, it's the problem of decoherence in these um, uh, setups to reveal non-classical effects of gravity. And <clears throat> I will start by briefly going back to the, the core of, of, these, uh, of these experiments, and uh, I will then focus on some of the most promising experimental proposals, just these kind of effects. And then I will straight, uh, go straight into the, uh, an, an analysis of the decoherence uh, effects in these kind of proposals, uh, focusing on uh, environmental decoherence. And I will also take into account the effects of the CSL model, which is uh, one of the most uh, studied um, collapse models. Um, so very quickly back to the uh, core of the uh, experiments. And so our question, our, our aim is to look at potential uh, quantum features of gravity at low energy scales. Uh, to do that, we may, may ask ourselves, uh, um, may consider the one of the most quantum aspects of, of quantum theory that is entanglement, and we can um, ask ourselves uh, um, if uh, gravity can, can gravity induce entanglement between two masses, and 
Bose and colleagues and uh, Karen Vladko uh, uh, have answered the question and they say that uh, no, uh, un un unless uh, it is, uh, unless a mediator of the gravitational interaction is non-classical. Um, so the, the authors have slightly different arguments. Uh, so uh, Bose and colleagues uh, make use of the LOCC theorem and um, while well, uh, Karen Vladko tried to uh, rephrase the problem in a, um, um, in a way that doesn't that doesn't make reference to the the, the, the quantum formalism uh, as we know it. We try to, to rephrase it in more general terms. Um, um, but anyways, even if a different uh, the arguments differ slightly, uh, their conclusion is the same. But uh, if the gravitational interaction is mediated and is capable of, of uh, generating entanglement between two massives, then its mediator must be non-classical, must have some non-classical features. Um, how do we test this? Uh, as we've seen many times these days, uh, this is the most uh, obvious way we could think of uh, testing this uh, kind of effects. And here is an ideal uh, Max Zender-like type of interferometer experiment with two masses. Um, and, and this is useful to make, to make a, uh, an estimate of, of the scales involved in, in these kind of effects uh, and at to, to guess um, at which scales we could hope to um, see this kind of uh, effects, as, so entanglement generated by gravity in, uh, in um, between two masses. Um, so uh, how do we make these estimates? Uh, uh, simplest way, we can uh, um, assume that the gravitational interaction, uh, uh, gravity obeys the superposition principle so that we have some sort of branch-wise uh, interaction. And of course, we assume some Newtonian-like potential between the different branches. And uh, uh, after the after the, the the masses are refocused here after this uh, kind of uh, bin splitter, but um, sort of bin splitter uh, uh, tool, the thing that reconverges the masses, um, um, we see that uh, we have this this final state here, and so we see that the different phases pop up in different uh, in front of different terms of the of the uh, of the state of the system. And the phases depend on the product of the masses and the time of flight, delta t, and the distance between the different masses, the different branches. And yeah, and remarkably, this is uh, at almost all uh, um, values, for almost all the values of these parameters, uh, this is an entangled state. Um, so uh, we, we need this to, to make an estimate about the scales involved in the experiment. So uh, ideally, uh, to have maximum entanglement, we want phi, the phase phi, to be of order one. Uh, and these, these are the values proposed by Bose and colleagues to reach these, these, these amounts of, of, of phase. Um, and we see that, uh, as we know, we have big masses involved. And this is one of the main sources of, uh, of the uh, technical challenges for these kind of experiments. Um, two of the uh, most uh, promising setups that, 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 are, that we have seen and are, was proposed uh, initially by uh, Bose and colleagues, and uh, also the one um, by Krishnand and colleagues. And they're sort of, of the two ends of the spectrum, as, as I will explain uh, a little bit better later. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just quickly recap them here as we, we've seen them, especially uh, uh, the one on the left. So uh, it's based on the guide like interferometry. Um, and, these are the values again are proposed by Bose and colleagues for these kind of experiments. Uh, on, on the right, instead, we have the one proposed by Krishnan and colleagues. Um, it's, um, it's kind of a mechanical setup. Uh, so they think about doing this like uh, with uh, levitated nanosphere, or, or we've seen uh, many uh, experimental proposals also in, in the last days. Uh, for these kind of experiments, uh, but the, the authors model these uh, these kind of setups in in following ways. So they, they seem to put uh, two particles, uh, two spheres, in in harmonic potentials. Uh, they cool uh, the spheres down to the to the to the, glow, to the ground state of the, of the of these harmonic potentials, and then they assume that to either they consider two cases. In one case, they keep the masses trapped at all times, and in the other case, uh, they uh, remove the traps and the particles are a, are um, in a free fall. And uh, in these setups, um, the entanglement would potentially be induced, uh, the gravitational entanglement would potentially be induced by uh, the different attraction, uh, the different gravitational attraction between the different parts of the wave, of the, um, wave functions of the two uh, spheres. So uh, the closer um, parts will interact um, stronger than the other one. So this will uh, potentially induce the entanglement in, in this kind of setup. Um, <clears throat> 
down here, we have the values for the parameters proposed by Christian and colleagues. Uh, we see that we have uh, bigger masses involved here, um, but yeah, this is different uh, kind of um, technology from, let's say, from the uh, both setup. Uh, but in some, somehow, uh, roughly speaking, if you look at this setup, it, it's, it looks like, uh, roughly speaking, as is, as if we take the uh, limit when delta x goes, shrinks uh, down, becomes much smaller than the distance between the two spheres. So it's, it's kind of the, the limit of the both setup when we, the size of the superpositions goes down uh, to zero, like, or becomes much smaller than the distance between the two spheres. Uh, I, will, I will make this claim clearer in, in the following. Um, so uh, as we've seen these days, plenty of uh, experimental challenges. Uh, here are just some of them. Uh, I, I focused on uh, decoherence. Uh, so um, um, we, we want to limit decoherence effects in these kind of setups to, to, to avoid, uh, um, because they could, affect the entanglement of system, we could remove the entanglement system. And we wanted uh, to um, make this study more precise. So my colleagues and I have studied how uh, the coherence affects entanglement these systems. We have extended a previous, um, a previous study from Guillaume van den Kamp and Chevalier um, that have studied the, both the, the coherence in both the setup, we extended this to also the Krishnanda setup. We found uh, a common uh, way of describing of, of limit of, of describing the maximum amount of decoherence tolerated in the system, and also we have taken into account the effects of the CSL um, model. So yeah, um, again here we mainly focus on um, decoherence due to the residuals, so the collision with the residual air molecules uh, surround the masses, and the scattering, absorption, and emission of thermal photons, um, and also as I said the uh, decoherence like uh, behavior um, induced by the CSL model. Um, here, just uh, report the well-known uh, decoherence equations, uh, decoherence equation for the density matrix in the uh, position basis. And here we have the, as we know, this term uh, induces like induces um, exponential suppression of the off-diagonal terms of density matrix uh, in time. Um, and this gamma here. Uh, depends on two parameters. Uh, so gamma zero, which is sort of decoherence rate, and A, which is the uh, spatial extension involved in the uh, decoherence mechanism of, uh, of interest. Um, so for, for, for both setup, uh, um, we simply, uh, we make a simplified model of, of the experiment. Uh, we <clears throat> assume that position, the particles are in, uh, after they get uh, split in the two uh, uh, branches, they are in position eigenstates. And, and we do not deviate from the parallel trajectories. Uh, <clears throat> in this situation, we have a sort of <clears throat> a reduced, uh, simplified description. Uh, we can have a simplified description of the setup uh, with just two degrees of freedom per particle. Um, and we assume uh, um, a Newtonian, uh, Newtonian potential, so Newtonian interaction between the two, between the different branches. And so our Miltonian here is the following. And we can study the entanglement in the system <clears throat> going through the um, eigenvalues. Uh, so we calculate the eigenvalues of the partially transposed density matrix of a system, and we find that uh, we find that one of these uh, eigenvalues can be negative only if the following condition on the decoherence rate is uh, satisfied. Uh, so we uh, we need a decoherence rate which is smaller than this uh, amount where we see all the parameters of the system popping up, and we can reformulate the the, the this condition. Uh, in the following way, we, we say we have to we need to add a coherence time tau c, which must be must be uh, bigger uh, must be larger than this tau g, which is a characteristic time of, of the system um, of gravitational entanglement in the system, um, and uh, so this is the bound for for maximum amount of coherence allowed tolerated by the system. So for values so co for coherent for coherence times uh, sh um, shorter than this value, we see no no gravitational induced entanglement in the system. It's uh, completely uh, the experiment is uh, uh, ruined. Um, so um, here on the left we plot um, the minimum eigenvalue of the partial transpose density matrix density matrix. And for different time, for different duration of experiment and different values of the decoherence rate, and values below this black line are um, negative values, negative values of this um, 
eigenvalue and so correspond to um, entangled states of the system. Um, on, on the right, we, uh, we plot the uh, logarithmic activity of a system. And here it's the uh, analytic expression of, of the uh, logarithmic activity. And here we plot it for different times uh, of experiments uh, and <clears throat> as a function of time of the experiment. And so we see in blue line, the case with no decoherence in the system. And we see that we reach entangled states um, after about uh, 26 seconds, more or less. Uh, while for uh, higher values of uh, the coherence rate, the amount of entanglement goes down. And when we cross the threshold that we seen earlier, um, there's no entanglement, there's no gravitation induced entanglement in the system. Um, the, we've done an analysis, analysis of uh, the coherence also in the Krishnanda setup. So here we start with the same assumptions of uh, Krishnanda and colleagues. And so we assume these two particles trapped in 1D harmonic potentials. Um, the, uh, we, we, call, we assume that the particles are crewed down uh, to the ground states of these uh, uh, harmonic potentials, and um, the traps are subsequent, subsequently released, so the particles are uh, in a free fall. And the, we assume the gravitational interaction to, to have the following form, which is uh, just an expansion of the second order in delta x of the uh, usual uh, Newtonian potential. Um, and here, xa and xb are the uh, um, displace, displacement of the center of masses of spheres from the very initial equilibrium position. Uh, so basically, this mass is starting in a, in a Gaussian state, so in the ground state of the, of the um, harmonic traps, they are released. Uh, the size of, of the wave packet will roughly go, uh, with, uh, will roughly behave in the following way. So it will start expanding. Um, then there's this interaction that entangles the two uh, spheres. And since we have just a second order, um, we, we have a second order Hamiltonian, we can just, uh, we have a, a Gaussian dynamics, so we can just use the uh, tools uh, for quantum information for uh, Gaussian, Gaussian states. And so um, in this case, in this system, we, uh, so we started with the behavior of the system using the Heisenberg Langer Van equations. And these are the usual uh, contribution, the usual parts. So, and then the coherence, um, uh, the coherence in the, um, results in these additional terms to the uh, equation for the um, uh, momentum of the um, center of mass of the spheres. And so we have a damping, damping term here, minus gamma p, and psi, which is a noise. And in there, uh, in gamma and psi are related to the, the coherence parameters that we've seen earlier. Um, so how do we check for entanglement? Well, we calculate the covariance matrix of the partially transposed system. Uh, we, found, we, fi we find its uh, symplectic eigenvalues, and these eigenvalues are, are, are um, related to the state of the system. So if we have, if, um, if we have a, a symplectic eigenvalue going below one half, then we have a, 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 an entangled state of the system. And we find that that is possible uh, only if the, the following condition is satisfied by this lambda, which is a decoherence parameter related to the, the ones we've seen earlier. And so uh, we have this condition, also in this, case, also in this case, we have this condition of the maximum amount of decoherence uh, tolerated by the system before losing uh, all kind of um, entang gravitational induced entanglement. Um, uh, what is interesting is that uh, if we take uh, the, the tau g, the characteristic time tau g that we've seen earlier, and we take the time uh, the limit uh, delta x uh, much smaller than d, which is the case here because the, in this case the size of the super, of the wave packets of the, of the particles are much smaller um, is much smaller than the distance between the two spheres. Um, when we, if you take that limit, uh, we recover. We see that the condition we seen earlier, this one tau c um, bigger than tau g, becomes the following becomes the, this condition that, that we found now. So in, certain, in this sense, we, we, uh, this condition on the coherence times is, is valid for both the setups. Um, and this is why um, this is like, um, supports the, the, the part that supports the claims that I made earlier, but uh, it looks like as if the Krishnanda setup is just the um, limit of the both setup when uh, the size of the positions uh, goes down and becomes much smaller than the distance between the two spheres. Um, so we found this, uh, also in this case, we have found this bounds on this threshold on maximum uh, decoherence allowed in the system. 
And here on the left, we plot uh, this minimum symplectic eigenvalue of the system uh, for different uh, values of the uh, distinct coherence parameters, lambda, and different times of the experiment. And here, uh, um, points below this black line correspond to ensemble states of the system. And on the right, we plot the logarithmic, logarithmic, logarithmic negativity of the system in this case. And in the blue line, we have the case of no decoherence. Uh, while uh, higher decreance rates in the, uh, result in a lower amounts of entanglement, or if you want to look in another way, if keep, we take a, a fixed amount of, an, of logarith logarithmic activity, if you have a higher decreance rate, it takes more, more time to, to reach the same um, value, if, it, if that value is reached at all. Um, so this is just numbers, let's plug in the uh, experimental conditions, so the pressure, temperature of the system, temperature environment, so we, for simplicity, we assume that the temperature of the system of the particles, the masses, is equal to the temperature of the uh, environment. And as we said earlier, we consider the coherence used by the collisions with the air molecules and the scattering uh, emission uh, absorption of uh, the gravity radiation. Um, and here, uh, so we, we, we plot uh, this condition in terms of pressure of the residual air molecules and temperature of the, of the whole system and environment. Um, and we, we read this graph in the following way. So we want to, we want, so let's take the black line, for example. This is a black line. This black line uh, corresponds to uh, experimental conditions that allow for the minimum amount of, of entanglement, indu gravitational induced entanglement in the system. So that means that values of pressure and temperature below this, uh, and above this uh, black line, so uh, on the top here and right here, uh, uh, exclude any kind of, of gravitational entanglement in the system. Um, the, others, the other lines instead correspond to, uh, let's say, stricter uh, conditions. That, uh, so if you want to obtain a uh, higher value of uh, negativity or the same value, but in, in shorter times, then we have to uh, impose, uh, um, we have to achieve uh, stricter uh, environmental conditions. Uh, the same is done uh, for the Krishnanda setup on the right. And, uh, so rough, roughly speaking, uh, we see that we are, around, uh, we are around one Kelvin temperature and 10 to the minus 16 Pascals of pressure of the residual air molecules. Um, if you're interested later, uh, I, since we've seen these days, but at some, at some scales, uh, pressure starts not to be a useful quantity anymore. Uh, if, you, if you're interested, I can show you the same plot with uh, the number density of the air molecules, of residual air molecules. And, and, and so maybe that may be a more useful reference in, in these cases. Um, so this table just summarizes uh, the results of the previous graphs. And here we see that we need around, again, uh, one Kelvin of temperature and 10 to the minus 16 Pascals uh, of um, pressure and to reach this kind of, 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 of uh, negativities. And this columns, uh, in this column, we can see the time uh, that the system takes to, to reach these values of negativity. And for just for comparison, we're on the last column, we have the uh, distance that these um, particles in free fall uh, uh, cover during this time. And so if, uh, if you're doing this experiment uh, in free fall on Earth, uh, we want to, uh, uh, keep our eyes on, on, on this value. We don't we don't want it to be too too large. Um, so uh, again, back on on um, just to summarize what we're saying on this bound on coherence on coherence time. So we found that for both setups, this uh, bound this threshold for the coherence times is is is, is, re is relevant. So this threshold can be used for both experiments to to identify quickly what is the uh, at least the order of magnitude of, of the um, um, coherence times that we are aiming for. And uh, we express it is, uh, in the following way, in a, in a, as a function of the parameters of the system. Uh, um, remarkably also, uh, this is related to the uh, time, uh, time scale of experiment, because uh, for example, in the both setup uh, with no decoherence, uh, pi alts times tau g is also the time that the system takes to reach the maximally entangled uh, state. Um, so this is, this parameter is um, maybe as uh, we uh, intuitively expected is a, a time scale of experiment, but also uh, uh, gives an idea of what is the coherence times that we need for these kind of experiments. But here we have proved it uh, in, in specifically like for these two setups and in a, 
um, it's in like at least for a positive setup, it's like an, a super an, an exact quantity, an exact quantity, like we found an exact threshold on the maximum dec uh, decoherence allowed by the system. Uh, of course, ideally, we would like to uh, uh, minimize these coherence times. How do we do that? Uh, we see two ways. One is increasing the mass, of course. The other one is taking um, the superposition size, so enlarging the superposition size. But of course, we can't go beyond D. And of course, we have even a stricter limit uh, because, uh, as we said many times, and uh, we want to avoid any kind of sort of short uh, other kinds of interactions between the two particles. So we have to be extremely uh, particularly careful about the two closest branches. And uh, if we impose a minimum separations on the two closest branches, then tau G can be expressed in this way. And then when the delta X become, becomes much larger than uh, this minimum um, distance between two closest branches, um, tau G get, uh, uh, reaches this value. So it goes like that. And uh, the minimum distance, uh, we, we can play with that. We, we find some way of shielding the other kinds of interaction. But I will say uh, we, we don't have that much freedom uh, here. We have, so the only other thing to do is, of course, going on with masses. Uh, that is, of course, challenging uh, technically. Uh, so bigger masses, as, uh, it's, it becomes increasingly hard to propose bigger masses. Um, so we're kind of constrained here on, on, on what we can do. And, and on right, just for comparison, uh, we report out the coherence times for the uh, effects we consider scale uh, with the um, radius of the obvious spheres. Uh, so we have here tau g goes with uh, radius over six, and one over uh, radius to the power six. While the other ones go, actually, we lower uh, uh, powers of r, just the scattering of the photons is uh, with the same value of r. So ideally, uh, if we didn't consider any other uh, coherence process, uh, we could like twitch the temperature, go down with temperature, go up with bigger masses, and we will get an advantage. But of course, there's all sorts of other problems that uh, come up when we go with big masses. Um, oh, we also we also consider the uh, effects of the CSL models for the continuous. So there, there are four minutes left on your talk. Yeah. The continuous continuous localization model, and um, so uh, this is one of the most studied uh, collapse models. So it, it has been proposed uh, as uh, Peter Marker was saying earlier, as a, a solution to the uh, measurement problem of quantum mechanics, uh, it's a sort of phenomenological problem. So it has, this model has two parameters in, uh, inside. And uh, one is this lambda, which is a sort of collapse frequency. And the other one is RC, which is, um, is related to the uh, spatial extension involved in a collapse of the wave, of the wave function. Um, this experiment is still need but still await for uh, experimental confirma confirmation or falsification. Uh, as we've seen earlier with Peter Barker's presentation, it, there was uh, this plot of the region of the parameters, uh, and some experiments started putting bounds on, 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 the, on the upper part of this um, uh, region. Um, the, the, the values that we find in literature, uh, the most common values we find in literature are these uh, 10 to the minus 7 for the radius, for the RC, and this uh, uh, interval for lambda. Mm. How can we can take into account the coherence effects in these uh, setups? Uh, is uh, we conveniently the uh, CSL induce a sort of a decoherence like effect on the on the uh, uh, setup, and so we can use actually the same uh, decoherence master equation um, in the both setup, for example, and just we modify by these parameters. And also in the Krishna setup, we just need to add a, a noise. Uh, well, doing the same analysis, the same analysis we do for the environmental decoherence, we uh, come to the conclusion that the CSLB, all these uh, parameter values of parameters proposed in the literature, uh, would, would prevent entanglement creation in the two setups. And, the, and this happens by far, like by at least six or seven orders of magnitude. Uh, for example, in the both setup, um, we require lambdas to be smaller than 10 to the minus 24 seconds to the minus one. So it's it's we're uh, it's it's uh, we're very far from the, the, the but. Um, the estimates in literature. Um, yeah, so just to, to sum up, we assume that environmental decoherence is a serious challenge for these setups. We found these uh, coherence times that um, it's about threshold on coherence times. And, and uh, what is uh, interesting and maybe useful uh, is that uh, any other decoherence mechanism with, a, with the same uh, master equation can be, uh, can be uh, basically the following threshold. So we uh, for a rough, so quick order of, um, estimate of the coherences times involved, uh, we required we 
just sum up the, the clearance rates, we take the inverse, and we see if that is a, um, larger than this tau g. Uh, we see that, roughly speaking, for both setups, we need uh, around 10 to the minus 16 pascals of pressure of the residual molecules and temperature of the system and masses of around one Kelvin. And we, see, and we also seen that uh, any proposed va value of the, uh, for the CSL uh, parameters uh, would prevent entanglement generation in the system. And that by far, by six, seven orders of magnitude. So uh, this just maybe shows that um, how, how maybe how far this uh, realization of these experiments is from the uh, actual state of the art technology. Um, um, at the moment, but yes, the, we are hoping to do that uh, as soon as possible. Um, so I just want to acknowledge my, my colleagues in, uh, in Trieste and uh, in Oxford, and yeah, I'd like to thank you for attention. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot for your for your nice talk um, and for for this uh, theoretical investigation of these decoherence effects. Um, so we have uh, a few minutes for questions now. And there are already some, if I may ask uh, the first question uh, on your slide 14, which is actually, I think visible there, there that was exactly uh, the, this temperature pressure curve. So why does it just from the shape look so very different, you know, on the right and the left hand side? What's the reason for this, you know, um, uh, the shape yeah, of this? Uh, so it's the reason that Krishnanda is the, uh, the uh, long wavelength, wavelength mm -hmm. of the, the Koreans, uh, Parameters. So, so there's just an, an additional one over uh, square root of temperature uh, um, here that changes that the, the the shape of the um, of the curve. But um, let, let me just show you. So this is just uh, sorry. So here, yeah, when we take this uh, alpha squared, uh, mm -hmm. we get a uh, we get an additional a different um, dependence on on on, on temperature. Temperature, but just to just to to show you this uh, plot in terms of the number density. So in number density, we have both the exact same behavior, uh, like not with the same power, but like we have same uh, big old both mm -hmm. yeah. in way. So it's just like uh, because we express in terms of pressure and that tricky like uh, okay mis 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 misleading thing comes comes up. But. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, TP, do you want to ask? Oh, hi, thank you. Thank you for a very nice talk. So, other question just about the last part. Suppose CSL is correct and detected, it is still possible that gravity is quantum in nature. What is your plan B then? Are there some ideas that um, how would you save the situation? Maybe not this particular experiment or some. Uh, I, I'm just curious if people have thought about it. Yeah, um, we um, we try to. So you can make a, a graph of how these all these effects go with the scale of the system, mm -hmm. and and maybe at some point they all go with slightly different. Uh, so they all depend on. on Slightly different on the on the parameters of the masses. So uh, I don't remember now what, what result, but like at some point there's a region of the parameters where CSL model maybe is not um, is not um, doesn't doesn't prevent this entanglement creation. But I think we are in extreme hmm. regimes. So uh, extreme regimes of masses. Are, are, okay, but excellent. It's being thought about. It's being thought about. Yeah, that's what you're saying. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, you. I think it's yeah. Um, I think, anyways, it would be very uh, difficult. Like, uh, if CSL model were true, I think it would be very difficult to 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 to, to perform these experiments because, uh, yeah, it, it excludes a, a big region of, of of what of the parameters that you can choose for experiments. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have to unmute. So, okay, thanks. Um, Sugato, do you have a quick question, or otherwise we ask it in the in the panel uh, discussion part? Yeah, we can. No, I have another. Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice work, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So we, 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 we come back to that later. So let's now move on to our final speaker. So we go back to experiments. Uh, and um, that's the final talk of this session. Actually, it's Tong Kang Lee from Purdue University in the United States. And the title of the talk is Ultra Sensitive Talk Detection with an Optically Levitated Nanoparticle. So please, Tong Kang, um, take it away. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, can you uh, see my full screen? Oh, this yep, slide. yeah, we can see it. Okay, yeah. okay, thanks. Thanks a lot for the uh, invitation. It's really a fantastic uh, workshop, and I learned a lot about uh, gravity. Uh, I haven't really worked much on uh, gravity or quantum gravity, but uh, we do. Uh, uh, I'm uh, very interested in this uh, topic. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, one of my work uh, is about the uh, left torsion balance, which is aiming to uh, create a uh, quantum Cavendish torsion balance. Um, uh, ideally, can be used for uh, studying quantum gravity in future. So today I will talk about uh, uh, object left uh, torsion balance and the Casimir effects. Uh, I will first talk about the uh, optical levitation uh, and the torque detection. And then I will talk about our recent work on near surface trapping and on chip optical levitation with a uh, metal lens in vacuum and a uh, quantum optical mechanic with virtual photons or Casimir effects. So I, I will first talk about the first topic. So I mean, uh, for the audience of this workshop, I mean, uh, we are very familiar with uh, the Cavendish torsion balance, which uh, is the more, one of the most important device for study gravity. And as I show here, this uh, basic schematic of Cavendish torsion balance, we have two balls left by a thin a torsion wire, and we can put the two uh, test masses to study the gravity between the test mass and the left uh, suspended uh, spheres. So uh, this is, of course, is very important in gravity and uh, measure the gravitational constant for the first time. And uh, uh, here shows another uh, example of torsion balance, which is used by coolant uh, to discover the coolant's law of electrostatic force. So it's quite uh, uh, amazing that uh, two of four fundamental interactions, I mean, electromagnetic interaction and the gravity were first studied experimentally by torsion balances. So the torsion balance is really important uh, and it's still used uh, for static gravity even now. I mean, for example, uh, Max uh, Esmame used uh, the uh, uh, suspended torsion balance to measure gravity between uh, millimeter sized particles very recently, as we heard uh, a few days ago. So uh, since the current torsion balance is so important, we would really like to uh, reduce the size uh, by many orders of magnitude to uh, create a very sensitive uh, torsion balance as a, a theoretical limit. So we are interested in creating optically lifted coverage torsion balance for quantum lift torque and force sensing and may be used to study quantum gravity in future. So uh, Cavendish measured the uh, torque due to gravity on the order of 10 to the minus seven Newton meter uh, over 200 years ago. And in his original torsion balance, he used two balls uh, on a bar separated by about two meter, and use a torsion wire to suspend it. So uh, we would like to reduce the size from uh, two meter to about, uh, let's say, 200 nanometer. And by reducing the uh, size by seven orders, and of course the mass also, we will be able to uh, improve the torque sensitivity by uh, many orders. So uh, we will be able to create a, an optical left the torsion balance that can uh, have a torque sensitivity about 10 to the minus 28 Newton meter per square root hertz. So uh, this is, why we think this is an analog of the current torsion balance is because first of all, we have uh, two suspended spheres and then the torque uh, is introduced by the uh, Polarize the laser beam. Basically, we replace the torsion wire by a uh, laser beam. When the uh, nano dumbbell rotates a little bit, it will change the polarization of the laser beam. And then the, uh, these twisted photons will give a counter interaction and give a torque on the nano dumbbell to uh, rotate the back. Okay. So, this is uh, kind of an analog of a uh, Cavendish uh, torsion balance. So in order to create a such an optically lifted Cavendish torsion balance, we need to create a uh, nano dumbbells. So uh, basically, we start with a silicon uh, 
silicon nanoparticles. And we can put that uh, in solution and then in, add uh, some air slow to induce aggregation. And then we can close the shear to make uh, bond stronger. And we can use centrifuge to purify them to create uh, to obtain nanodumbbells. So of course, this is only one method to create uh, nanodumbbells. There are other methods too. And here shows two SEM images of chemically synthesized uh, nanodumbbells. So here, nanodumbbells is the size of about uh, 200 nanometer. Uh, here's uh, examples, is the size of about 100 nanometer. So we can control the size of the nanodumbbells. Now with uh, uh, nanodumbbells, we can launch them and to uh, and capture them in vacuum. So here is just a setup we have in our lab. Uh, we have two setups. This is one of the setup. Yeah. So uh, the key component uh, inside the vacuum chamber is an optical aperture lens uh, with an NA about the 0 0.85, and that it will focus a laser beam. Uh, and to lift the particle. So here I uh, shows an uh, audio imaging of a nanoparticle given in the uh, vacuum chamber. This can be a nanosphere or a nanodumbbell or other particles. Okay, so we can lift the nanodumbbell uh, in vacuum with an optical tracer. Now we would like to see, uh, study the dynamics. So if we use a linearly polarized laser, then, uh, because of the uh, shape of the nano dumbbell, it's a long axis will tend to align with the electric field of the linearly polarized laser. Uh, and then it will still do some browning motion due to the collisions with the surrounding air molecules. So, and uh, when the orientation changes a little bit, it will feel a torque from the orbital tweezer and we'll go back, okay? So then we would like to monitor its orientation so the orientation of the nano dumbbell can be determined by the change of the polarization of the laser beam. Basically, as you can see here, we have a nano dumbbell trapped here. And you change, if the orientation change, we change the polarization of the laser beam. So we can uh, monitor the uh, change of the polarization of the output of the laser by a, a, a polarizing beam speeder cube and a detector. So here shows the power spectral density of the motion of the left nano dumbbell. You can see the motion along A, is Y, and Z direction, and the torsional motion. And then we calculate the torque sensitivity of the left nano dumbbell. Uh, the sensitivity uh, can be about 10 to the minus 27 Newton meter per screw hertz for 170 nanometer uh, nano dumbbell. And it can be even better for smaller nano dumbbells. So this is a case for a, a nano dumbbell in a linearly polarized laser. And we can also uh, use a circular polarized laser to drive the nano dumbbell to rotate at a high speed. And uh, the, the rotation speed will uh, be inversely proportional to the air pressure. But this is not surprising because uh, if we reduce the air pressure, the nano dumbbell will feel less uh, frictional torque. And the, the Talk from the orbital tracer will not change as a pressure. So as a result, the uh, rotation velocity will increase when we reduce the air pressure. So uh, and we have observed a rotation speed about uh, one gigas or uh, beyond the 60 billion revolutions per minute uh, in 2018. So this was the fastest uh, rotor at the time and we have uh, very uh, glad that uh, our work was selected as one of the highlights of the year of 2018 by uh, APS physics. So after that, uh, we tried to improve this further. Uh, we uh, were able to rotate it uh, faster to beyond the five gigas or uh, 300 billion revolution per minute. This is quite remarkable because at this speed, the linear velocity at the edge of the Nano dumbbell, in fact, is more than four kilometer per second. and have a centrifugal acceleration of more than 10 to the 14 meter per second square. And then the maximum tensile strength is more than 100 gigapascal. So basically, eventually, the uh, nano dumbbell break down because of this uh, huge uh, 
centrifugal acceleration. So we can load the particle at a high speed. And then next, uh, we would like to test how uh, sensitive it can detect the torque. So it's, uh, we just want to verify the sensitivity of torque. To do that, we, uh, as before, we have a, a 1.5 micrometer laser for trapping and the detection. And then we add another laser, uh, 10, 20 nanometer. Uh, uh, we use a, a wave plate to uh, change the polarization to be a circular polarized laser to apply a torque. So we will be able to test how sensitive we can detect the torque from this additional laser. So uh, as before, we can monitor the uh, low change of frequency of the nano dumbbell or a nanosphere as a function of time. And then we can uh, turn on and off the uh, additional laser to see the rotation frequency change. And basically from the uh, new signal law, the Newton signal law for a uh, rotation, we will be able to determine the uh, torque from the change of the rotation frequency. And that's what we do. So basically we can turn on and off the uh, 10, 20 nanometer laser to see the change of the rotation frequency. Or if we module the, the uh, laser power sinusoidally, we will be able to observe the rotation frequency also change sinusoidally. And then we can do a Fourier transform and we will see a peak in the uh, rotational power spectral density. And from this, we can determine the torque. Okay. So here shows uh, the torque sensitivity of our system. This is on the model four times 10 to minus 27 uh, new, Newton meter per square hertz. And we, if we average for 100 seconds, uh, we can measure torque as small as five times 10 to minus 28 Newton meter in 100 seconds at a pressure of 10 to minus five torque. So the sensitivity can be improved further at a lower pressure. Okay, so we uh, confirmed that yeah, we can create a nano dumbbell and lift them in vacuum and detect a very small torque. So there are many applications of this system. One thing is uh, we can study uh, rotational microscopic quantum superpositions as initially proposed by uh, Uriel uh, Romanizer uh, in 2010. So you can have a nano load in a cavity to correspond to the quantum region and create a superposition state. Uh, we also propose that uh, we use uh, uh, a nano diamond. We can also use the ignition to create a rotation of quantum superposition state and then study the, uh, like a quantum carpet in the rotation. And uh, people also have proposed that uh, this season can be used to study uh, claps induced or rotation localization. And uh, uh, can potentially can also be used to study uh, quantum gravity. Um, we are also interested in to lift the nano dumbbell or nano load near a surface. So if we use a bilevision plate as a subject, then in fact, this can not only generate a Casimir force, but can also create a Casimir torque. Basically, if the uh, main axis of the bilevision plate is different from the uh, main axis of the nano dumbbell or nano load, the nano uh, load will feel uh, Casimir torque and will be on the order of uh, 10 to the minus 25 Newton meter, which should be detectable. And if we uh, chop a nanosphere or nano dumbbell, rotate at a high speed near surface. This in fact will also feel a quantum vacuum friction. Uh, it's because uh, rotation, uh, you know, a rotation particle generates a non inertial uh, frame, which will be able to excite quantum vacuum fractions to generate real photons. So it's a very few uh, talk. And the uh, talk from quantum vacuum friction will be on the order of uh, 10 to the minus 28 Newton meter. Uh, it should be detectable in principle, but requires a high vacuum with a pressure uh, on the order of 10 to the minus 9 tau or below. So basically, uh, we can start a lot of things with a, a nano dumbbell near surface. So next, we would like to chop 
is a near surface. So next up, we will talk about near surface trapping and on cheaper optical levitation is a meta surface lens. So first, uh, we just use a conventional optical laser to trap a nanoparticle near a surface. The first step, in our case, the surface will be uh, generated by a cantilever. So when we have an orbital taser, it will be partially reflected by a cantilever and generate a standing wave. So uh, we can chop the particle near the surface. So here I show uh, the pulse vector density of the browning vibration of the cantilever and then the browning motion of the nanoparticle. And uh, uh, we can change the power of the laser to tune the frequency of the uh, nanoparticle particle, and then if we change the laser power, we can make them match. So basically we can chop a, a nanoparticle near a cantilever, and we can also tune the frequency to be to make them on resonance. Okay. And we were also thinking about the, can we, uh, you know, don't use this uh, complex uh, uh, bark object lens, or maybe we can use the, put some structure on the surface and chop by themselves. So then we think about the uh, on trip orbital levitation is a meta lens in vacuum. So it has some advantage. Uh, eventually, I mean, the meta lens works like a conventional lens, but they have some advantage. First of all, it can have high NA and it can be very thin. It can be generated nanostructure structure with thickness less than one micrometer. And it can be created by uh, dielectric materials. So it's a ultra high vacuum compatible a whole metal lens. In our case, the subject will be sapphire and the material for the metal lens can be uh, silicon. So it uh, can be heated up to uh, higher than 250 uh, degrees centigrade. So it will for bake out. So it will be high vacuum compatible. And we can also use nano fabrication to create a very complex uh, chopping potentials. So here shows how we created the uh, metal lens. So basically these are AC imaging of the nanostructures on the metal lens. Uh, basically we change the diameter of these uh, nano uh, cylinders to be able to change the, uh, the effect on the face of the uh, laser beam. So you will change it periodically and you will be able to generate the face gradient to uh, Defect the laser to be focused. And here shows an object imaging of a metal lens. The diameter is about 400 micrometer, and the focal lens is about 100 micrometer for this example. Uh, of course, we can change the focal lens. And the design is to have an NA of 0 0.9. And experimentally, we measure the NA is to be about 0 0.88. So it's very close to our design. So we can uh, create an uh, uh, orbital teaser with this metal surface. And uh, here shows uh, a nano sphere uh, left by a metal lens. And uh, we can, of course, look at the trapping frequency. Right? The frequency uh, slightly higher than what we generate by conventional uh, aperture lens. So, Frequency of A is, is along A is about 200 kilohertz, and along Z will be about 100 kilohertz. Uh, so it can also we demonstrate it can also chop in uh, vacuum, high air vacuum. And then we uh, try to generate a dual trap. At the beginning, for simplicity, we uh, have one trap generated by a metal lens, and the other will be a conventional lens. And we can uh, create a dual beam trap. Uh, with the separation part of 1.5 micrometer, uh, we uh, change the relative ratio of the laser power, and we found that we can uh, basically have the particle hopping between these two traps, even though they separate by 1.5 micrometer. And we change the polarization of the laser beam to change the ratio of the laser power, so we can let the particle chop in one trap first and then jump to the other and then go back. Okay, so uh, we can uh, chop a particle near surface and also use a metal surface lens to chop at them. So now we will talk about uh, our interest on uh, study uh, cast effect. 
And uh, also uh, talk about the quantum of the mechanics of actual photons or Casimir effect. So of course, uh, we all know, I mean, we can uh, have a, a cavity of the mechanics to have a laser to draw or cool the motion of a, a middle, which is movable. So in this, in conventional uh, cavity of the mechanics, you have a high power laser. When I say high power, it means there are lots of photons in the cavity, many, much more than one photon. And then you try to cool uh, mechanical motion of the phonon of the uh, particle to reduce the number of phonons to be ideally quantum ground state to be zero or a few. So we have lots of photons and then a few number of phonons. And people also have proposed the option to use uh, optomechanic coupling to couple two mechanical oscillators in a cavity. Again, you need a, a, a high power laser to drive it. Uh, a lot of photons. So, so I'm become interested in, you know, can we, when we say quantum optomechanics, we have a lot of photons and then a uh, very low number of photons. Or can we also use uh, only a few number of photons or maybe even zero photons to achieve such a coupling? So the answer is yes, it's doable. Basically we can use uh, quantum vacuum fluctuations or virtual photons by the Casimir effect. So in this case, there's a zero photon in between. I can couple them uh, by the Casimir effect. So you, we can have quantum vacuum fluctuations couple two mechanical oscillators. So basically we can have pure quantum effects from the, uh, the mechanical motion may not be in the quantum region, but the uh, photons are in the quantum region. There's a zero photon. Okay, it's pure quantum effects. So we do did that experiment. Basically, we have uh, two up, uh, candy, uh, micro mechanical cantilevers. For, for simplicity, for theory, we intentionally put a microsphere on one of the cantilevers so to make the theory simple. Because if we uh, just have two cantilevers, then it's very difficult to align the direction and difficult to know the separation. Uh, with one microsphere, we, uh, it's e much easier for the alignment. And then we put a, a optical fiber, two optical fibers to monitor the mechanical motion of the cantilever. And with that, we can use the virtual photons to couple the mechanical motions between two uh, mechanical oscillators. And we first did the measurement of the Casimir force. And it agrees with the theory very well. Of course, for ideal uh, metal, ideal conductor, you can calculate the ca gradient of Casimir force, very simple. We, only depends on the Planck constant, speed of light, and then the separation. So the index is pure uh, quantum. But for good films, uh, it's not an ideal conductor. So it's slightly different from the prediction of ideal conductor. But nonetheless, our experiment measurement agrees with the prediction for real good film very well. And then we use this Casimir force to couple the mechanical motion of the two cantilevers. So as you can see, uh, so initially the two cantilevers have different frequency, so they cannot couple directly. And we modulate by piezo to modulate the separation uh, as a frequency equal to the frequency difference between two mechanical uh, oscillators. So with that, we can couple them strongly. And you can see, you, you can see uh, the splitting between the en energy due to the interaction. So we can also a rapid oscillation between them. Uh, with that, we also modulate the system and to engineer the system to include an exceptional point. This is the Hamiltonian will be a uh, non Hamiltonian. Uh, with that, uh, we able to achieve non reciprocal energy transfer between two uh, mechanical oscillators by Casimir effect. Basically, we can have the energy to transfer from cantilever one to two, but not from two to one. And we modulate in uh, one, like, let's say, clockwise. And if you change the direction of the modulation, then we'll move to the other way. So uh, we achieve the strong coupling by virtual photons. And then we go one step further. So for example, in the initial Casimir effect, uh, Casimir, you mentioned that you have two parallel plates uh, to change the uh, quantum vacuum fractures 
in between the plates. Uh, because the change of boundary conditions, uh, only certain modes are allowed. The outer side of the plate is will be the same as before. And then we basically would like to go one step further to put the three systems. So we have one plate here, and then another uh, like a microsphere, and then another microsphere. So we will be able to change the quantum vacuum fractions of the both sides for the center plate to study the effect. So this will be the first experiment to study casimir interaction between three objects. And here shows our experiment setup. So we have one center can deliver, and we coat both sides by gold, and put that another microsphere on one can deliver, and then microsphere on one can deliver. And then put a fiber in the fermenter to match the motion of one can deliver, and then another one. In fact, we have another one I didn't show here. Uh, we basically, we have three fiber in the fermenters to monitor the motion of all three cantilevers to study the casimir interaction between three objects for the first time. So we modulated that, uh, change the uh, vacuum fractions on both sides. So we did the measurement of the casimir uh, force on the middle cantilever. So we changed that. So we fixed the separation, uh, D1 and D2 to about 800 nanometer, and then move the cantilever in between and measure the casimir force on it. And then of course, not surprising, the casimir force will change the direction because with the cantilever closer to the left, uh, microsphere is a few attraction to the left. And you will, of course, it feels the casimir force from both sides, but will dominate by the attraction to the left. And it's closer to the right microsphere, you'll feel a Casimir force dominated by the attraction to the light. So we can observe this uh, change of direction of the Casimir force. And we can also measure the uh, force gradient uh, as function of the uh, separation. So this is the first measurement of the Casimir uh, interaction between three objects. Uh, so you have, in fact, you have two minutes left on your talk. Okay, okay. Uh, this will be the last slide. So uh, basically, we, uh, you know, when you measure the gravity uh, or other things, we would like to screen the Casimir effect. So the question is how thick we need the film to be to screen the Casimir effect or the uh, the charge. So we did that recently. We did a theoretical calculation uh, to study the effects of the thickness on the Casimir effect. So we found that basically uh, the decay layers will be about the 10 nanometer. So the, if we put a, a thin film in between two objects, then the two objects will decay exponentially, more or less exponentially, um, with a scale on the 10 nanometer. So from that, you can estimate the thickness we need it to be. Okay. Uh, in conclusion, we talk about uh, an optically left Cavendish torsion balance for adjacent to torque detection. And we also talk about the near surface trapping in the own chip of the levitation with a middle surface lens. And the uh, quantum optomechanics is virtual photons. Okay, and thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, beautiful talk and this uh, extremely cool experiment so that this uh, a very, very nice uh, work. Uh, thanks a lot for sharing this. Um, so we have some time for uh, for questions uh, to Tong Yang, and then I think we open like the panel discussion. So if you have first questions uh, on, on the last talk, um, I think Sugato was first. So please ask your question, Sugato. Hi, so, so very, very impressive work, right? Uh, so. So um, uh, so this new work I did not know about. So this um, this uh, so uh, how far are you from getting pure states of your two uh, you know two spheres on the the top between which you are having this uh, you know virtual uh, photons exchange? Uh, can you go to pure like ground states of those things or squeeze uh, states? I mean, in principle, we can but right now uh, of course uh, we do a little bit cooling, but not much yet. So right now we basically studied. Uh, uh, we we observe the, the energy transfer between these three. We oh. couple the motion of all three by Casimir effect. So we observe the energy transfer from left to the right. Mm -hmm. And we can basically switch them, uh, turn on and off the interaction between these two by mm -hmm. modulating the middle one. 
Mm. And uh, but right now we perform this experiment at room temperature, so it cannot really oh. grass it. But uh, I think it's a quite interesting direction of quantum optical mm. mechanics with virtual photons. So in principle, you can put that both uh, you know, optical state to be in quantum state and then a mechanical state also be in the quantum state. Oh. And can you use this for some kind of sympathetic cooling? Like you cool one of them optically and the other gets cooled because of your- Right, right. Yeah, we, 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 we have achieved that. But uh, okay. at the end, we didn't probably those things because we only cool a little bit. Yeah. It, it's close, but uh, far, far away from quantum state. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so actually, Anupam, you always have your hand up very first. Do you have a question or you want to make a general <laughs> announcement? No, no, I think it's, um, uh, yeah, I have a que question. So, um, first of all, very nice uh, experiment, uh, very impressive. I have to say that um, you are one of the experimentalists who uses the proper quantum field theory language, uh, virtual photon and, and all, all the exchanges. So I'm very glad uh, to, I mean, as a field theorist, uh, it was a comment. But the second, my question is, um, so you showed this is very valuable for the QGM experiment because you showed that even at room temperature, you could screen the electromagnetic. So you, you have created a fairly good uh, you know, Faraday cage with 70 nanometer thickness. Uh, and is, is this what I understand from uh, your uh, So no, 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 yes. But basically we are interested to study what's the effect. So right now the thickening is pretty thick. So at this specific experiment, uh, the, the thickness of the cantilever is very thick. It was screen that complete. So the interaction in reality is you have the middle and then middle to the right. There's no delay cast mean angle between the left and right at this moment. So, but we did a calculation to see how thin we need to be to mm -hmm. have the delay interaction. So it need to be really thin on the order of 10 nanometer basically. But at this moment, the thickness we have is too much. Okay. okay. Maybe okay, I'll so, so, so. discuss later more with you. Thanks. Okay, so yes, uh, let's let's maybe uh, have some questions from experimentalists. So, Andy, I think you were you're next. Yeah, hi, Tong Kang. Very nice talk. Uh, very nice to see the progress on the Casimir uh, uh, measurements. I had a question about the result you showed with your measurement with only the two the two surfaces. So you were able to distinguish between an ideal conductor versus the gold film, as you may be aware. There's been some questions in the literature about what's the right model for conductors, whether it's the Druda model. Or the right, right. So that's, a, that's a more difficult. Have you Our been able to, is, you haven't been able to make any distinction? More precise to I, I, think that, yeah, yes. But I'm very interested in that. I think reason we are proposing, ideally, you will really want to think that you may need a, some superconductor to kind of thing, let's see. Interesting. Uh, uh, you, you will have a superconductor and then change the temperature to have superconductor phase transition. You can deliver think those kinds of things. But at this moment, our, uh, I mean, initially we are interested in this uh, coupling by Casme effect. So we are not that precise to study those kind of effect. Uh, one thing limits our precision, honestly, is uh, uh, the surface roughness and those kind of things. But, but we, we, we try to produce it. But uh, that also depends on the funding agency. So the funding we get for this project is from a little bit of engineer, like from DABA, so they are more engine kind of application than fundamental compression. Mm -hmm. But if we can get some funding from people for, for more engine fundamental physics, then we will more focus on those kinds of things. Thanks. But yeah, but I, I was uh, really interested, uh, really glad we can make these three objects to work. Okay, good. So, so, so Peter, uh, your your question, your next. Okay, yeah, really nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I love your meta lens. <laughs> I would <laughs> like to have one. Um, but can you tell us? Um, so, what we, you know, it's a very simple question. What what's the working distance then that you? Because you know, quite often there's a problem with a lot of experiments we do is that you know the working distance is pretty short. Do, do you get quite a good working distance then between the, the face of the metal lens and, and the tracked object? Oh, so uh, uh, you mean, the, uh, you, you talk about, about this one, so. No, 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 just the working distance from the metal lens, like how, how I far. See. So how the far? working distance in this case is 100 micrometer. Okay. Uh, so the one thing is this. So for conventional aperture lens, the working distance is very different from the focus, right? But for yeah. this metal lens, because the thickness of the 
film is only, let's say, about 500 nanometer. So the right. working distance is the same as the focal length. Right, okay. Okay, so it's small, but the lens itself is quite small, basically. Is that right? Yes, yes. Uh, the thickness of this film, uh, I didn't show here, but the thickness, uh, the height of the pillars is only like a 500 nanometer. Right. Oh, that's lovely. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you okay. can make a focal length even shorter, 10 yeah. micron or more. But we intentionally put up 100 micrometer is uh, too easy to see the nanoparticle particle from the side. <laughs> Otherwise, it's become difficult to see the particle because these pillars also scatter light. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, of course, we be able to know whether there's a particle by the power structure, but you cannot see directly like this. <laughs> right, okay. You will have nano pillars nearby, there will be a lot of scattering. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Right. Okay, thank oh, yeah. you. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot. I, I have a very quick question on actually the first part of your talk, the, the dumbbell one. Um, yeah. So the chemical preparation you do for this, how, how selective is this? How many dumbbells do you actually get, which you then can uh, so put in your trap? Let me say this. The, the chemical away can really massively produce them. We produce like one gram of them. But on the other hand, uh, at the end, you know, we don't really need that many. Uh, mm. Like one gram is like a billions of billions. Yeah. Uh, so at the end of we, uh, we initially use that one, but eventually right now we didn't really use this method. Okay, so I guess what my question is is when you do like the, the last step, the centrifuge step, that's obviously where you separate the different densities right. Uh, right. from each other. So that is a very you know mono dispersed sample. So you only have dumbbells in that solution or uh, almost. Uh, so uh, the way we do is not that good. We basically purify like a half of them dumbbell or okay. seventy percent. But okay. there, in the literature, if they centrifuge multiple times, they can improve to about like 97%. But uh, mm -hmm. by the end, the right now we didn't really use this method. We basically chop a nano, two nanospheres directly, and then we'll combine them become nano dumbbell. Mm -hmm. Okay, because thanks we, a lot. We only need one. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know, Anupam, should we, should we open like, you know, discussion with, with all speakers of, of this session um, in, in a way now? Yeah. I, I know, for instance, Sugato, you, you had a question for Simon.